Well done. Those notices were so much better than when I do it. Okay, if you'd like to, if you're one of those that brings a Bible, or you've got a phone you'd like to read along with me, then we're going to be reading from Mark chapter 4. And uh, it's kind of funny, because Mark chapter 4, and we're going to read from verses 35 to 41. You're going to be familiar with the story. Um, You're probably going to get to the end of this reading and think, I thought he was speaking on peace. Um, What on earth has this got to do with peace? Well, hopefully, um, we'll be able to go there, and I'll be able to talk to you a little bit about peace. And thank you to Malcolm as well. Uh, I thought what he said about hope was re- uh, hope about peace was really really good, and uh, included some of the things that I'm going to be talking about this morning. So here we go. If you're there, and the good thing about bringing a Bible or turning on your phone and reading, getting access to the Scripture is sometimes when you read it, you'll pick up something that I'm not going to mention. So I think. If you haven't got it to read yourself, you might miss out on something that actually is written there for you this morning. I can't cover everything, so I recommend getting access to the reading yourself because it might just be something that God wants to bring to your attention in the reading that I won't bring up myself. Here we go then, Mark chapter 4, verse 35. That day, what day? The day when Jesus had been teaching all over the place and told parables and he'd had a busy, busy day. On that day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up. We all know what one of those are after yesterday. And the waves broke over the boat so that, was, that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. And you might see on that notice I put this. The disciples asked each other, Who is this? And that's a good word for us all today to consider, to remind ourselves, to think again, Who is this? Who is Christ? In the face of that word spoken to the wind and the waves, if somebody can stand up, address wind and waves, and they obey him, who is he? Who is he? Well, the first thing I'd like to share with you this morning, because like I said, I'm sure you're thinking, what on earth has this got to do with Advent and with peace? Uh, I want to start with this picture I put up, and it's about Jesus. Who is he? I want to say, first of all, he is not the author of our troubles, but the author of our faith. And it is often when we go through troubles that our faith is refined, it's strengthened, we feel closer to God. He's not the author of our troubles, but the author of our faith. And sometimes when we go through some real tough things, Jesus is scribbling away, writing down what our faith is all about. And it's coming to us, and he's letting us know what our faith is really about. It means we can stand in the time of trouble. We can stand in faith in those times of trouble. The disciples on the boat discovered the presence of God with them. In the boat, in the trouble. And I love the fact that Jesus 
I mean, they were afraid. They looked at the wind and the waves, and they were afraid of the wind and the waves. These were experienced men who were out on a boat, and they know what it's like to be on a rough sea. They're terrified. By their own confession, they feel like they're going to drown. Jesus looks at what they were afraid of, and he speaks to it. If you're carrying something in yourself today, and you're afraid, ask Jesus to speak to it. Ask Jesus to speak to the things that you're afraid of. And he will. He will address the things that you are afraid of. And you will discover him and his power when he addresses the things that you are afraid of. And our faith is the thing that helps us in times of trouble. And our faith, and remember we said this last week, hope is in the future, faith is something we draw on from the past, and it's something that is present with us now. So you might not have peace today, but when you start exercising faith, it will give you access to the peace that God gives us. It's through faith that we receive the peace of God. And so we have to exercise our faith to experience the peace of God. The peace that is present today. It's not something we hope for in the future. I did like what Malcolm was saying. I'll bring it up now, you know. It is peace with God. And that isn't something you hope to hope for. It's something that you can experience today. And why? Because of something God has done in the past. And it's that news that brings us into the present. We have faith and therefore access to peace today. We can have it today with God. You can have peace with your family member that you've fallen out with. That you always squabble with and argue with. They might not have peace with you, but you can have peace with them. Why? Because we say, Father, forgive us for our sins, for all the things that we've done wrong. God, forgive us and forgive those who have trespassed against us. For those that are offending us and those who are hurting us, we're going to forgive them because by doing that, we've got access by faith to the peace of God, which is what we want. So they might not be at peace with you, but you can be at peace with them because you're at peace with God. And you exercise that faith today. Peace with God and peace, I just call it, with the world. You know, whether it's with you, whether it's with creation, whether it's with my family or my friends or whatever it might be, I just put that in the category of peace in the world and peace with God. And some of us have been robbed of that peace. You know, when someone sins against you, it robs you of the peace. When somebody sins against you, something is taken from you, stolen from you. And it's actually, people don't know at the time, but that's the thing that disturbs you and disturbs your peace. The very thing that someone's taken, you need to get it back. And you can get it back. By going to God and in faith saying, somebody's stolen something from me. They've stolen my peace. I'm troubled by what Joe Bloggs did to me. I'm dissatisfied at the moment. Something has disturbed my equilibrium. I'm not at peace. It's okay, you can come to God and you can receive and have that peace back that people steal from us when we when they do bad against us see Jesus wants the best for us but you know what not everyone does I was in a meeting this week and it was a board meeting I'll tell you I was with these missionaries and they're talking about who they're sending out and all about before you go to the field preparation. And they're doing the Myers-Briggs and the strength finders and this and that and da-da to work out all these and how we can best place people in these things. And there's some benefit. There's some benefit. I'm not mocking it. But no one talked about selfish ambition. 
I mean, you could, have, you could be an I, B, A, C, D, who knows what, and a person with selfish ambition, you're going to ruin the team. They didn't talk about sin. That ruins teens. Selfish ambition and sin and, and, and greed and, and all these things, they exist in teens as well. And just because our personality type says we're extroverts or introverts hasn't dealt with the issue of sin. How are we going to work with other sinners? That's what we've really got to prepare people for. How can a team of people who, are, who have these faults that are common to all humanity, how are we going to best prepare them to go and work as a team to take the love of God into the world? Jesus wants the very best for us. He said this, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Well, I've got to say this about the picture. That isn't the picture of peace that I get from reading the Scripture. You know, it's about God being present in the midst of the trouble, and there's not a ripple on that water, is there? And Jesus gives to us in a way that the world doesn't give. You see, the world gives and takes away. And Jesus doesn't. He gives it. And therefore, it's always there. Do we access it? What had the disciples learned? So maybe they would have turned earlier before they got into such a difficult situation. Imagine if they'd woken him up five minutes earlier or when they first felt them. They thought, as experienced men in the boat, they could handle it. Sometimes when trouble comes along, we think we won't bother Jesus. He's sleeping. He's resting on a cushion. And we can handle it without him. And he'll be so pleased that we didn't bother him. Well, he wasn't pleased, was he? When they did wake him up, he told them, What's the matter with you lot? Where's your faith? Come and access now. The, uh, the door is open. You can access it now. And so often we leave it until it's well out of control before we bring it to the one who's in control. And that's true for us all, isn't it? Sometimes we're slow to access what God has provided. He has given us peace, and he has not and will not take it away. But there are things that we do that can mean we lose touch with what God has given us. And at that point, we need to exercise our faith so we once again receive the peace that God has provided for us. It's a, a wrongful act or a, a wrongful attitude uh, that we can have and that sometimes disturbs our peace. And then, as Anna was saying in the music, it's time to surrender. It's time to lay it down. And when you do, you experience the peace of God once more. You access it again. If you keep your wrong attitude, I'm not going to forgive them. I don't care. It serves them right. You won't feel the peace of God. You'll be disturbed. Maybe there's something, some pattern of behavior that you're familiar with. You're always doing it. You're just going to live with it until Jesus comes back. But it troubles you. It can mess with your conscience. It can mess with the peace. It can stop you developing your faith. It certainly stops you exercising your faith. It can absolutely numb you. We're not to live like that. We're to live out the peace of God, which is present for us today. The Christmas message contains that wonderful idea that something greater has come. Christ has come. And Christ has come and Christ is greater than your problems, greater than your fears, greater than 
all the things that you're struggling with. And he has come, and he has come, and he was sent by God to deliver you out of a dominion of darkness into a kingdom of light. And he did that with his coming. And when he stood on the earth and, and he, he, he did all of his godly works, he demonstrated that he was God and that he was for us and that he'd come for this purpose of delivering us into his kingdom. You know, I said to Teresa, I'm going to say something that is theologically incorrect this morning. So, is she in here? She was. Oh, good. She's not here, so we can talk about her. <laughs> I said, I'm going to say something that's theologically incorrect. You can't stand up and say something theologically incorrect. So, we nearly had a row on the way here while I was trying to explain to her uh, that. Uh, and I'm going to say this. At Christmas, we receive Christ. Well, that's theologically incorrect. Because theologically, when we receive Christ is when we hear the message of the gospel. And upon that, we receive him if we believe in him and accept him. And so, oh, you can't say something theologically incorrect. I said, I said, because when we sing, O little town of Bethlehem, it says, may Christ be born again in us today. Well, that's theologically incorrect. But we all sing it, because what we mean by that is that we're going to bring to mind all those things of Christ that we may not have brought to mind if we didn't have this special season. So we're learning about hope, we're learning about peace, joy is to come, and love on the carol concert. They're all things that we bring to mind, and we receive them, not for the first time, but they come back. And they minister to us. So we receive the message of Christ afresh. At Christmas time, we bring it to the forefront of our minds. At Christmas time, we remember that Christ came and we have received him. And the angels declared the good news of his coming and the peace that he brought. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace among, these, among those with whom he is pleased. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Glory to God in the highest. Now, the next thing I want to say is, peace comes not from the absence of trouble, from the, but from the presence of God. Alastair McLaren said, peace comes not from the absence of trouble, but from the presence of God. God was present in Christ. If you read Colossians 1 and 2, among the many other places, you will discover, if you read the Scripture, that Jesus was God. Incarnate, made man, dwelt amongst us, and in him we have peace. We'll all go through things, that we call trouble. And it is fundamental that we discover God's presence in the midst of it. We always want God to sort out our problems because we think as soon as they're all gone, we'll have peace. I think we should have peace and then the problems become so much smaller because we're aware of the person who is so great amongst us. One benefit of the gospel is the presence of God with us, even in times of trouble. And our reading today is a great example of the presence of God in the midst of a whole bunch of problems. On this occasion in the boat, the disciples experienced the unexpected turbulence of events above and beyond their means of control. All of us, and I think, you know, if you look at our church, most of us are not doing a bad job of life, are we? We're not exactly the most, you know, broken bunch of people, relatively speaking. You know, I mean, we're actually pretty good at life to some extent. But all of us will discover that there are things that are above and beyond our ability to control. 
And when that happens to anyone, in the church, outside of the church, once you experience something that you're out of control, that's when you start to reach out and you want some help. You become vulnerable because you're weak. And in the church, we've got the presence of God. And so in our weakness, God is our strength. Praise God for that. For some of our friends, I know a family at the moment, they lost a member, you know, a family member, another family member. And the children are very, very troubled. They want to know that Nan is in a good place. And they're vulnerable and they're open. And what sign is there? What sign that Nan's okay? We're asking God to give us a sign. Oh, I said, He's given a sign. He gave a sign. The virgin will be with child and she'll give birth to a son. And if you go just from there, you can miss Genesis, Exodus, Deuteronomy, all of them if you like. Just start there. You'll find out that that sign came at Christmas in the stable. And that sign then went on to tell us about the kingdom of God and the love of God. And that sign then died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, to reconcile us to God, to deliver us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. That That sign is the sign. Look at that sign. Your nan confessed Christ. She put her hope in him. Guaranteed she's in the presence of God today. She's at peace. And you know what? They want another sign. There's only one. And it's Christ. And they need to take comfort from the message because the only sign that's going to truly give them peace will live be if they look at the sign that God promised the world all the way back there in Isaiah. He is the sign. These were experienced fishermen. They know the boat. They know the water. and They were in danger. And that sometimes we find ourselves out of our depth. Suddenly we find ourselves in a storm. There's a diagnosis we get. Somebody's got cancer. Someone else is living through some hellish circumstances. Someone's just lost their job. Somebody has got a debt mountain so big that the only thing they could live with was debt. And now that's been pulled as well. Some people haven't got a home to live in. Some people are in such a difficult place. It's beyond their control. I can't stand it when even some of my friends will say, oh, it serves them right. Well, it might serve them right. And I'll tell you what, I probably deserve to be in the same place, but by the grace of God, I'm not there. And we've all got to help these people. So what if they deserve it? God's wanting the very best for them. Praise God for the debt center who are trying to help people who have got out of control with regard to finances. And God has given a provision for people. Praise God for the food bank, for people who haven't got enough. Well, they made some stupid decisions. Oh, who hasn't? What they need now is food. And when they're stronger and more healthy, maybe they'll be able to make some better decisions. You know, and some of them are, it's not even their fault. Someone walked out of their life and left them in a right mess. And here we are, the church. If we don't have mercy, who will? Have mercy on them. Praise God for the food bank. Through whom God is having mercy on people who have got out of control. People who have got out of control. Where is the peace in such times? Well, that's why our ministry needs to be accompanied by a message. Because nobody found peace in a can of baked beans. In Christ alone. Our ministry must be accompanied by a message. Our eyes 
are sometimes fixed on our troubles. We must help those who see a lot of trouble in their life and let them see Christ. Let them see Christ. Now, I found out this as well. Our troubles often lead us to misunderstand God. Have you ever met anyone who's had some trouble and they then began to explain God in a way that they clearly have misunderstood God? Amen. Well, they're in good company because the disciples got it wrong and all. They woke up Jesus and said, don't you care? To the one who cares more than all of us combined, they said, don't you care? Because they thought that the trouble that they were in was from God. They now... When you start blaming God for the trouble that you're in, you start to get a, a wrong view of God. And that's what happens to us sometimes. We misunderstand God because of the circumstances that we are going through. So if you're on the top of the wave and everything's good, then God is good. But when you're right under the bottom of that wave, sunk into the sand beneath the jolly waves, then you begin to wonder whether God is the God that you thought he was. That happens to the disciples, it happens to me sometimes, and it may very well happen to you on occasions. That you begin to doubt what you've understood about God because of the problems that you're going through. That happens. And it happened to the disciples. So what do we do? What do we do when we're in that position? When we, how do we avoid going down these patterns of thinking thinking incorrectly of God because of the situation we're in what do we do well first of all we read God's word because it's bigger than the problems and troubles that we're going to go through we need to get God's word into us you know you read the Psalms you read the Proverbs they're fantastic for understanding God and understanding our relationship with God. So you've got, this, you've got this psalmist and he writes, well, I was in a pit. I mean, things were so bad. And he picked me up out of that pit and he put my feet upon the rock. And you go, well, I'd like to know what that's about because you know what? I feel like I'm in the pit at the moment. And I wonder if the God of Psalm 40 would be around for me if I call from my pet. Will he answer? Yes, he will. Amen. Psalms are brilliant. These people are going through the emotions and God's with them. Read them. They're amazing. Psalms. I love that, you know, that Psalm 119. Man, that's a that's a whopper. That is the biggest, the longest psalms of all. And they've chosen a letter from the Hebrew al alphabet to start every single verse. And always it comes back to the Word of God. It enlightens me to who you are. It directs me in the path of my life. The guy's singing a song about it. Singing a song about God and what he's revealed and who he is and, and how good it is, he says. And you know what? When you end feeling great, it's nice to hear someone saying... No, no, this is, this is who God is. This is the truth. and The Word of God brings us to that place. And that's why I like to go through books of the Bible so we get the Word out. I find a lot of themey Bible leaves a lot of people still not knowing what the Bible says. But it was a great, golly, the guy was the best communicator on the planet. But I still don't know what the Word of God says. I would rather be not the best communicator in the world and the people understood what God's, the message of God was. That to me seems a priority. Sing. Sing uplifting songs. If you're down in the dumps, sing some uplifting songs. Now when I was, where was I? I'm really 20, 20, 20, 21. I used to love Irish folk songs. I didn't realize they were all about their hatred for the British people. <laughs> 
So I used to sing them. You know, the Irish people would look at me like, why is this guy singing these songs? Doesn't he know? And they have this brilliant song. And he was, I was 18 years old when I went down to Dublin with a fistful of dollars and a cargo of dreams. Take your time, says me father. Stop rushing like hell, for life is not all that it seems to be. See, I still remember him. <laughs> and I had lost my mum, and dad was in a tough place. And I was in the middle of London, 20 years old. I, didn't, I was out of my depth. And I could relate to these folk songs, you know. I'm, I'm this young lad. Well, the young lad went to Dublin with a fistful of dollars. He ended up on a plane. He went to New York to live in New York and be a policeman in New York. And his dad's brother, who was a policeman, died on his arrival. And it's a sad song. The folk songs they usually go that way, don't they? But there was something, there was this little thread through the song. And it used to give me hope in, in London where I felt so out of my depth. And these songs would cheer me up, all about these Irishmen that were all over the world doing whatever they were doing. And it used to cheer me up. I didn't have faith in those days. I didn't know anything about that. But I used to sing songs to cheer me up. And there's a load of people. There are anthems out there, aren't there, uh, which are secular songs. But you know what? They give you hope. They lift you up a little bit. And we have all these fantastic songs available to us today for nothing. And you know, if you're down and you don't have peace, then sing a song. Sing a few songs that you know will bring you the message of Christ and lift you up. Sing the truth. You know, and can it be? And can it be? What a hymn. I've been there. I'm there. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? I know what it's like to sit there and go, can this possibly be that God has done this for me? Yes, he has. And suddenly from that place of doubt, I'm stood in the, in the place of faith. Hallelujah. Yes. And can it be? It can be. The song is so good. It's beautiful. So if you're in that difficult place, read God's word. Sing. Pray. Pray. Pray yourself. We have a prayer team every week that's up here at the end of the service. It's at the back during the worship time. Pray, oh, I don't want to get out of my seat and go forward. People might start wondering if I'm okay or is there something. And then they come out with all these like, well, guess what? We're all going to think it. And none of us know really what's going on. So get over that and get there to get the prayer. Yeah, that even rhymes, doesn't it? Get there to get the prayer. You know? Because we don't want you in the pit. We want you in the peace. We want you in the Trust. Oh, my days. That's so difficult, isn't it? Sometimes we call that faith. Trust God. Yeah, but it doesn't seem like, due to the circumstances going on in my life, that God's really with me and that he really cares. Well, trust that he does. Trust him. But it's hard, I know. And the final thing is fellowship. Fellowship. Don't run off with your unbelieving friends and seek their counsel. Run to the church and to your friends in the church for their counsel. They'll bring you God's word. God will speak to you and encourage you through the fellowship that's here. When you're in a difficult place, this is where you should be. Because fellowship will lead us to think rightly about who God is. There are some, these are some of the ways that will stop us going down those wrong patterns of thinking. These are just access points, though, I believe, to faith that will bring peace into our lives. 
just quickly then, let's touch on the biblical word for peace, the Hebrew word shalom. It means more than the absence of trouble. It means wholeness and well-being. And the, the evangelical church said, don't preach those kind of things. You'll be health, wealth, and prosperity. Well, actually, the gospel is a message of well-being and peace today. There, you are meant to be prosperous in a peaceful time. God wants to bless you, not rob you. Wants us to be healthy and, and wealthy and prosperous and all of those things, but in balance. But once you start thinking that God shouldn't bless you, you're on the wrong path. The opposite. God wants to bless you. And wants you to be blessed. Now we've all been wronged. I was saying earlier, sometimes it feels like something's been robbed from us. And what that is, is wholeness. We get robbed of the wholeness that God wants for us. And then it says, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the negotiations who sits down and talks between two people. That's not what it says. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are able to come to the broken and make them whole. That's what the word means. Blessed are those who are making others whole. Come on, I'll have a bit of that, please, Lord. I'd like to help other people feel more whole. That would make me a peacemaker. I'm having that. Come on, Lord, I want to be a peacemaker. I want to make people whole. Is that a good thing? Yeah. Who else wants to be a peacemaker? Yeah. Come on. Wow, that would be great, wouldn't it? Amazing. Blessed are the peacemakers because they make people whole. Glory to God. If anyone was ever wronged, if anyone was ever robbed, it was Christ. Christ became sin for us. His brutal death was wrong on the one hand, but it was the way which he brought salvation to us. Joseph was wronged. Did you see Joseph? Man, if there was ever a person on the earth that should have felt unwhole, it should have been Joseph. Man, that poor guy was robbed. Robbed by his brothers. Robbed by Potiphar's wife. Robbed by Potiphar. Robbed by the chief cupbearer. And yet his heart remained true to God. Hallelujah. What an example for us. His heart remained true to God. Don't let our wrongs make us think wrong of God. Those we did and those that have been done to us. Let us keep true to God. That means we practice. Father, forgive us. And forgive those who have sinned against us so we may remain whole so important if you've ever read the story of joseph you'll see the brothers are full of suspicion when things go wrong they think wrongly about god in genesis 4 and verse 21 it's at 20 42 21 they're racked with guilt these guys are absolutely racked with guilt regarding the way that they treated their brother Joseph. They said this. They said to one another, Surely we are being punished because of our brother Joseph. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. That's why this distress has come upon us. So they're beginning to think that the trouble they're going through is because of the way they treated their brother Joseph. We find out that Joseph's got the true picture. No, nope, God put me here for the saving of many lives. We're going to see that later on if you read through the story. But these guys can't receive anything except that God is against them because they're racked with guilt for the thing that they did to Joseph. Some of us carry guilt for something that we've done. And I, again, fair play to Malcolm's bit, we're not at peace with ourselves because we haven't forgiven ourselves. The message of the gospel is that God has forgiven us. So it's time to forgive yourself Hallelujah. and receive the peace of God. Forgive yourself. And the brothers couldn't forgive themselves. So they thought everything that went wrong was God. And 
wasn't the truth at all. The truth was that God was at work for the saving of many lives, as we find out in that story when Joseph speaks to his brother. In the Lord Jesus Christ, God has provided a way, a way to deal with the guilt that we all experience so that we can live in freedom from its cruel treatment of us. Guilt won't ever let you feel peace. It'll rob you of peace. It'll make you feel bad. And everything that goes wrong around you will start to lead you in all sorts of crazy directions because you're carrying guilt. And you'll doubt God and your understanding of God will change because you're full of guilt. It's time to have peace. God has provided forgiveness for you in the Lord Jesus Christ. So know that your sin has been forgiven, your guilt has been removed, and it's time to take it off yourself and lay it down and receive the peace of God. We have access through Christ to peace. And you can experience that peace today, the peace that makes you whole, if you access it through faith in Christ the thief comes only to steal kill and destroy I have come that they may have life and have it to the full this Christmas let us consider the peace that God brings a wholeness and wellness that is fulfilling and is the life that God intended for us to live Peace be with you. Amen.